in-depth TCP/IP networking. They they do go a little bit more in depth into to TCP/IP networking in this one in terms of subnetting, but I don't know why they didn't include it in the previous chapter because I don't know that it goes in all that much uh, uh, more depth. Uh, and then the second half of the chapter kind of covers some some other networking concepts, email and things like that. So objectives out of this chapter. Understand methods of network design unique to TCP IP networks, including subnetting, CIDR, and address translation. Um, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as network address translation, NAT. Virtually all small networks are going to use NAT uh, anymore. Explain the differences between public and private TCP IP networks. Uh, describe protocols used between mail clients and mail servers, including SMTP, POP3, and IMAP4. I don't think the book does a, does this process justice here. It's, it's not that it's all that complicated. They just don't really they just don't really talk about it. So I'll try to mention some of that. Uh, and employing multiple TCP/IP utilities for network discovery and troubleshooting, because if you're working on a network, you're going to run into problems on occasion. Designing TCP/IP-based networks. Um, we have to use the TCP IP protocol suite to be able to access the internet. That's what the internet's based on. Um, and so if we want to be able to access web servers, we have to be able to, to have those protocols loaded on our local machines. Uh, fundamentals of, of, of TCP IP, IP is a routable protocol. That means it's able to, packets are able to route and be routed across the internet from node to node, from router to router, to make their way to their destination. Uh, no uh, um, interfaces will require unique IP addresses. Every node has to have a unique IP address on it. Having said that, each node may have multiple IP addresses on it. Uh, in some cases, you'll have a server that is what's referred to as multi-home. It will have multiple network interface cards in it, and as a result, it will receive multiple IP addresses, one for each network card. Uh, two, two IP versions, IP version 4 and IP version 6, which we talked about earlier in the semester. We focus, this chapter focuses on IP version 4 because it's the most widely used. Uh, it's been around quite some time. Almost everybody uh, has equipment that's compatible with it, so you tend to see it a lot more. Some of the shortcomings of IP version 4 are fixed with IP version 6, but because it's not uh, a, a, as widely used, uh, and probably won't be for some time, we're, we're, we're still focusing on IP version 4. Okay, so IP version 4 uh, addresses four 8-bit octets. We refer to those as being in, in dotted decimal notation, 192.168.0.1, typical uh, private IP address. It's actually a representation of a binary number. You can convert those to binary. Uh, network host name assignment is done either dynamically or statically. So we either receive that IP address from a D, something like a DHCP server that's automatically assigned when we log into the network or when we uh, uh, um, <coughs> when we put up the machine to log into the network, or we statically assign it by manually typing it into a, into a configuration uh, dialog box in the machine to be able to manually set that. In a lot of cases, we prefer to use DHCP because it makes management much easier. It automatically is going to get its information, its DNS information, its subnet mask, its IP address information. But there is a little bit of a security concern there. So in some cases, we don't want static IP or, or dynamic IP addresses assigned. Uh, static addresses, on the other hand, because we're, we're statically assigning them, we know exactly what hosts have what address. It's very easy to keep track of for small networks, but as the network grows in size, it becomes more and more difficult. So you tend to see managers slide away from something that probably provides a little bit of security to a dynamic uh, approach using DHCP. Um, in the very early days of, of trying to break up networks, you had classes, <coughs> class, uh, uh, classes assigned to networks, class A, B, C, D, and E. We really focus on A, B, and C because those are the ones that are tra traditionally used to break up our networks. D and E are reserved for, for other purposes. The nodes network class provides information about what part of the IP address refers to the network and what part refers to the node. So, subnetting separates the network. 
multiple logically defined segments or subnets. We can break it up based on geographic locations, departmental boundaries, marketing, finance, etc. I've seen colleges that break them up based on students versus faculty. Why? So that traffic doesn't see each other. It's a way to separate, separate the two pieces of traffic. Uh, subnet traffic separated from other subnet traffic. Reasons to separate traffic enhance security, improve performance, and to simplify troubleshooting. So those different uh, uh, classes that we talked about. With the class A, the first octet, or the first eight bits of your, net, of your IP address refers to the network that you're talking about. So that 192, that refers to the network. That means you have a lot, a lot, a lot of hosts that you can potentially have on that network. In a class B network, the first 16 bits, or two octets, represent the network. The last 16 bits, or two octets, represent the individual nodes. So you can have a lot of networks in a class B network, and you can have a lot of hosts. Not as many hosts as you can have in a class A, but you can still have a lot. In a class two, or excuse me, class C network, you can have an awful lot of networks and only 254 hosts. Only, oh, yeah, that's still a lot of hosts, but uh, 254 hosts. Should be 256, right? Zero through 255. Well, there's a couple of those that are reserved, 0 and 256, or uh, 255. Uh, we'll come back to that here in just a little bit. Um, let's see. So we recognize those as Class A, Class B, and Class C. And this describes everything that I just got through saying, the first eight bits, et cetera, et cetera. So here's an example. In a Class A network, the address 114.56.204.33, it's because it's a class, we've identified it as a class A, we're saying that that first octet, 114, identifies that network. So that network is different than 115 or 113. But every host after that is part of that same network. So that's why you end up with so many hosts in a class A, class A network. This specific host is identified with, by the rest of that IP address, the 56.204.33. That's what uniquely identifies it on that network 114. Class B is just an extension of that, so the first two octets, 147.12. And uh, the same thing for class C, it's the first three octets, 214.57.42. So class, well, this is referred to as class well addressing. Drawbacks are that it has a fixed network ID size limits, uh, which limits the number of network hosts. When we say fixed, we're really saying that it's 255 or 0 is the only difference between them. We're not breaking those up. We're not uh, all the bits within a particular um, octet are either 1s or zeros. We'll come back to that here in just a second. Uh, it's difficult to separate traffic, traffic from various parts of the network. So. Subnet mass identifies how a network can be subdivided and indicates where the network information is located. A one corresponding, uh, one corresponding IP version address bit contains network information. A zero corresponding IP version 4 address bit contains host information. So if you think about the subnet mask as a string of ones, what is a string of all ones in an octet? What is that, the binary equivalent? 255. 255. So if they're all ones, that means it's 255, and they're all zeros, representing the rest of the zeros. So for class A, eight bits of information is used to identify the network, that first eight bits, which are all ones, and then the same thing for class B, class C, first two octets, first three octets. How do we go through and actually figure out which part is the address using submitting, uh, which part is the address versus which part is the the uh, uh, IP uh, the, the identifies the node. Wh which part identifies the node versus which part identifies the network? We go through a process referred to as anding. Put in the address, uh, the address, IP address in binary. We'll put in the subnet in binary. If we put them right over each other, we'll go through this anding process. So if our IP address is 199.34.89.127, and that's our our subnet mask. And this is a simplified example. The reason this becomes important is when you start breaking up the subnets into odd subnets. 
So if we add this, you're always going to have, like in this case, 1 and 1 is going to be a 1, because they're both 1's. Same thing here. If the second one of them is a 0, your network ID becomes a 0 down here. The same as it was up here. Because it's an AND process. So you go all the way through until you get down to right here. Now they're all zeros, so that means the last octet is going to be all zeros. That's where you end up with the 255.255.255.0. So that means we should have 256 possible addresses, right? 0 through 255. Well, there's a couple of them that are reserved. Zeros are reserved to refer to the network at 199.34.89.0. So that zero refers to the network. The 255 represents <coughs> the broadcast domain for that particular network. So that one's reserved. So instead of having 256 addresses, you end up with 254. Which, you know, for a small network, that's a lot of addresses. But for a large corporation, a university, it, it's not. So that was classical addressing. How do we use subnetting, like we just got through talking about, to, to actually subnet the, uh, a network into odd, uh, more odd networks, I guess is, is a way to phrase it. Subnetting breaks classical IP addressing rules. IP address bits representing host information change to represent network information. We can do this to reduce the usable host per subnet. So we end up with more subnets, but fewer hosts per subnet. Host subnets available after subnetting related to host information you get to borrow. So they go through a class B network here and give you an example. I think it's a little less wordy there uh, with a class C. But instead of having that clean break where the last octet is all zeros, what if we had one one dot zero dot zero or excuse me dot one one zero 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 zero. In that particular uh, subnet, if we had a subnet mask of that. 255.255.255.192, we'd end up with two subnets with 62 hosts per subnet. So it would be a way to segment our traffic. Um, so we'd end up with two different subnets. So we might have one that were faculty and one that were, were students. It'd be a way to separate some of that traffic. Where do you really, where do you have any savings as far as separating that traffic? Well, if we're operating in a switched environment, there's not going to be a lot of shared traffic anyway. But when it comes to broadcasts, those broadcasts would be shared if they were on the same subnet. So any of those broad, any broadcasts that might get sent to one subnet would not be seen by the sec, second subnet uh, by using subnetting. If we weren't using subnetting, it would, uh, all hosts would see that broadcast. Then they give you a formula for calculating subnets. My advice would be to go online because there, there are subnet calculators online all over the place. You can tell it how many hosts you want per subnet, depending on the calculator that finds. Uh, you can usually type in the number of hosts that you want in each subnet, or you can say how many subnets you want. You can, you can fill in the blanks, and then it will give you back the criteria that you need for your subnet mask. Um, the example that they, they start to subnet is a Class C network. That's what you start with, is this Class C. And they have a network ID of 199.34.89.0. And they want to divide it into six subnets. Now, they break it up into six, but the reality is it's really eight subnets. They just don't use two of them. Um, so here they are with their subnet mask. And let's see. Extend the, network, the uh, extended network prefix is 199.34.89.32 for one subnet. Dot six four for the next one. Dot nine six. Dot one twenty eight. Dot six one sixty and dot one nine two. So that opens up those addresses. Dot three three through dot six two. Dot six five through dot nine four. Dot nine seven through one two six. So it breaks those up. Now the reality is there's actually another subnet uh, up here that they're not bothering to share, and there's another one down here that they're not bothering to share. But if you only needed six subnets and you wanted it to to look this way, that's, that's one way you can do it. So essentially what's happening is you're moving in your subnet mask, you're moving to the right um, a couple of spots. And that's important when we come back here in just a second when we talk about supernetting. 
So class A, class B, and class C networks can all be subnetted. It just depends on how many subnets you want and how many hosts per subnet that you, that you want. Um, LAN subnetting, LAN, uh, LAN devices, interpret device subnetting information. External routers need network portion of the device's IP address. This is referring to how we are able to communicate from internally from a network externally uh, across the web. The servers that are responding across the web don't care about our internal portion of our network ID. That's our router's job to take care of that. All it cares about is the network portion of our ID. It returns whatever information it needs to the network portion of our ID, which is our, going to be our external router. Our external router is going to take care of the rest in terms of forwarding it back to, to the specific machine that requested it. So then they give a, a, a network diagram in there. Okay, classless interdomain routing, also called classless routing or supernetting. This is moving it back to the left, uh, back to the left instead of uh, to the right. So non -exclusive, not exclusive of subnetting, but it's a different way of arranging uh, the network and host information. Um, so using this approach, it does not have uh, the conventional network class distinction. So you don't have class A, class B, etc. So an example of subdividing class C network into six subnets of 30 addressable um, hosts each. A supernet is a subnet created by moving the subnet boundary back to the left. So with a traditional, a traditional subnet mask where we might want to break it down, uh, having a subnet mask of 255.255.255.244, so we move our ones to the right. With a supernet, we're going to move our, our zeros back to the left. What does that mean? That means we're going to have fewer subnets, more hosts per subnet. So it, we, we have the reverse um, effect of what we had with traditional subnetting. Um, so here you see this, the same thing in reverse. We move our, our, our subnet mask, we move the zeros back to the left. And so now we end up with a network ID of 199.34.88 which looks different than our IP address, 199.34.89. So it's a little bit different, and it's a, it's a way to manipulate um, the number of, of, of subnets that you have on your network and the number of hosts that you have on each subnet. Uh, having said all that, I don't know how much uh, a lot of this gets used. A lot of it is... It is kind of get administered to you from your WAN providers, and in a lot of cases, especially for smaller networks, you use network address translation, so you're using private uh, uh, IP addresses anyway, so a lot of this stuff, until you get into larger networks, is not something you really have to worry about too much. Um, CIBR notation, or slash notation, basically it, uh, uh, denotes what the subnet mask is by giving you the IP address. And then at the very end of it, denoting a slash and then the number of bits that refer to the network. So let's see if I don't give an example there. Let's say it was 192.168.0.1 slash 26. That would refer to the first 26 bits of an IP address referring to the network. The remaining bits would refer to your subnet mask. Internet, any questions? Like I said, as far as figuring out the number of hosts that you need and the, or the number of subnets that you want, uh, I would recommend going to a calculator online uh, because that information is right there. It's easy to type in. It'll automatically calculate it for you. Internet gateways. A gateway facilitates communication between different networks or subnets. It acts as kind of a go-between. Uh, so if you have two different types of networks, you can use a gateway to, to forward requests. Default gateways uh, first interprets its outbound requests to other subnets. So what it's going to do, gateway is going to see is a request that comes to it from a client on its home side of the network or on its side of the network that says, okay, this request is internal to the network, so it's going to send it back into the internal network to the appropriate host. Or it's going to recognize it as not being local to the local network and it's going to send it upstream somewhere. Uh, Network nodes allow one default gateway assigned manually or automatically by the DHCP server. <coughs> gateway interface on the router has an advantage of 
one router can supply multiple gateways or gateway assigned, uh, assigned its own IP address. Default gateway connections, let's see, multiple internal networks. Router uses gateway. So like I said earlier, gateways are just a way for, um, for addresses that are not meant for the local network to be forwarded upstream to presumably another router or another gateway that does know where that particular uh, message is being sent to. And that's the purpose of, of a gateway is to be able to handle uh, um, messages that are not, not known uh, where they go on the local network. And then they give you an example of a, of a gateway here. So if you have a client on this particular subnet over here, it, do, it has a message for something that's over here. It doesn't know where to send it, so it sends it to the gateway. The gateway says, well, I don't really know where it goes, but I know that upstream I've got another router up here or another gateway. I'm going to forward it to that one. That one recognizes that as being local to its subnet over here, and it will forward it to the appropriate machine. Most private networks use what's referred to as network address translation. It's a way to hide your private IP addresses on your local area network from the external world. It's what allows you to basically share your network connection among multiple computers with private IP addresses using one external public IP address. Um, let's see. So it provides more flexibility in assigning addresses. Network address translation. The gateway replaces the client's private IP address with an internet recognized IP address. So your as you request a web page, that means this this the process of network address translation has to keep track of your specific request. Why? Because if you've got a small network but you've got multiple users, how does it know that you made the request on your specific machine and not your buddy, your brother, your sister, somebody else on your local network? That's the process of whatever's providing your network address translation services. It has to man manage that process. It's usually going to be your router. It has to manage that process and keep track of which specific client internally uh, requested that specific web page. Reasons for using uh, address translation. Overcome IP version 4 address quantity limitations. Because we have private IP addresses, those are only internal to my network. Well, that means somebody across the street can have the exact same IP address. But we talked about earlier, every node has to have a unique IP address, right? Well, with private addressing, they're not public. They're not open to the rest of the Internet. They're only local to our network. So as far as our network's concerned, that is the only copy of that particular IP address. It's not public out on the Internet, so it's not. there's no conflict. Uh, adds marginal security to a private network when connected to a public network. Marginal because it's masking the specific machine that's being used. Um, having said that, there are ways around that, so it, it's, it's, it's only marginal security. Um, and you can develop your own network addressing scheme, though that, that sounds a little iffy to me. The book kind of gives the example of, of coding your IP address. Say, for example, a school that might have uh, the, the IP address starts out 10 0 if you're a student and it starts out 5 0 if you're faculty. Uh, then the next octet represents your room number. Uh, certainly a possibility, but I, I think you could run into problems there, especially uh, if the numbers get too high. Um, and they talk about static network address translation, which most uh, consumer routers will have some something similar built into it, and they might or might not refer to it as, as SNAP, uh, that basically allows you to have a static IP address internally for a server. So on your personal network, you can host your own web, uh, web server, your own email server, if you wanted to, using that. Um, address translation continues. It talks about dynamic network address translation, also called IP masquerading. Uh, provides an internet valid IP address might be assigned to any client's outgoing transmission. The idea is, is we have to have a valid IP address going out to be able to re retrieve coming back the, the resources that we're requesting, an email, a web page, etc. A lot of this is handled, in, in most cases, by port address translation. It's a way for the router to keep track of what specific requests go to which specific machines. This is what I was talking about earlier. 
So if we're going to access through a gateway a web server, let's say we've got multiple clients that are all accessing the exact same web server. How does it know how to respond with the appropriate web page from the web server for each client? How does it keep those straight? Well, we're accessing on our client over here. We're going out on 10.1.1.123. We're all different. We're all going to the same port number on the server. What we end up doing is we tack on to the port an additional identifier that allows us to keep allows our gateway to keep track of what specific web uh, a web page was, was requested from the specific in client internal to our network, and that's how we, we were able to access the various web pages um, and keep them straight from our various internal clients. So network address translation separates private and public transmission on TCP IP network. Gateways conduct network address translation, and most of the time it's done using a router. Uh, gateway might operate on network hosts, Windows operating systems, for example, you have internet connection sharing. Uh, the reasons for not using something like this are very similar to the reasons you wouldn't use a, uh, a, a computer to act as your print server. Uh, in the sense that it has to be on for you to be able to have access to the internet. Uh, you're dedicating an entire machine to a function that really can more easily be handled by a simple router. Uh, mail services, email, most frequently used internet services, by far the, the most used a application. You would tend to think that it, it might be web services, but the reality is, is we depend on our email more. People can, if your web uh, browser's not working for a little bit, you might get annoyed, but you don't usually complain. When your email's not working, if you're in the help desk, you get all kinds of complaints. Um, so an email server basically is going to be, its function is to provide delivery of mail, to store that mail, and to give you the opportunity to retrieve that mail in some fashion. Uh, you've got mail servers, which communicate with other mail servers and deliver messages, send, receive, and store messages. And then the clients. So examples of mail server, send mail, in the Unix or, or Linux world, uh, Exchange Server in, in the Windows world, and there's a variety of others that are out there as well. There's an HMail server, for example. On the client side, the book doesn't really go into this, but you've got both an application that you can run, uh, a, a dedicated application such as Eudora or, or uh, Outlook, or you can access it via a web client, which complicates the, the whole process, but uh, is probably what more people people are familiar with these days. The main protocol that you hear about with respect to email is SMTP. And SMTP is the protocol that gets used when you create your message and send it from the sending machine. The sending machine uses SMTP to send that message to the mail server, to your mail server. The internet uses SMTP to forward that email across the internet, across various email servers, to its ultimate destination server not the client, the ultimate destination server. That message stays there on that particular server stays there on, let me skip ahead, I'll come back from that in a second. It goes ahead to that particular server and stays there and waits there until the client logs in on their host machine. At that point, they need to download that message, but they don't use SMTP. That's one of the weird things about email. It doesn't use SMTP download the message, it uses one of two, two uh, uh, protocols for the most part, either POP or IMAP. POP is an older uh, protocol that's used uh, by clients to download email messages from a server. What POP does is it logs into the email server, authenticates the user with the username and, ad and, and email address, and then it proceeds to download messages. Sounds fairly normal, right? Well, what it's actually doing is it's, it's, it's actually downloading those messages, which means it downloads that, downloads that message to the, the client, then deletes it from the server. That means you can't access it from another computer. You log back in, check email again. Any messages that you downloaded previously are gone. The only email messages that would be there would be the ones that were sent in between that time. So POP really had some of those shortcomings, and, and as a result, it doesn't tend to be used all that much anymore. IMAP was designed to replace that. It's a, a newer protocol, and it's been around for quite a while at this point. 
But with IMAP, rather than downloading the messages, you're looking at the messages online. Even if you're using a client such as, as Outlook, the message remains online. The advantage of that is if you're moving around from place to place using ver uh, different machines, you can access your email from those different machines. Your messages will still be there. They won't be deleted until you explicitly delete them using your client. Um, so POP basically is really only appropriate in situations where you have people that aren't moving. They're, they're staying in one location. They access their email from one place, uh, one, one machine. They're not access, accessing it at home, things like that. Lime was a, uh, an extension to traditional email. Keep in mind, email's been around a very long time. It was one of the very first applications that, that was used on the internet. And email was originally designed just to handle text data. It wasn't designed to handle things like attachments, things like video, or hyperlinks, or all the various things that we have kind of come to expect in our email, uh, email anymore. MIME's purpose, the purpose behind MIME, and it's not something that users have to really do anything with as your clients handle it for you um, automatically, but MIME essentially takes those attachments, takes those pictures, takes the various things that you're attaching to an email or part of your email, the graphics, etc., and converts that into text. So then SMTP can, can send that message across the internet just like it was a text message, just like any of the, the uh, traditional email would be. On the receiving side, when you go to download that message, or you go to view that message, SMT, your, uh, your client uses MIME to then convert that back to its original format. So now you have your original email message plus the attachment or the video or, or the pictures or whatever it is you have to attach. So it's con doing a conversion to be able to use the existing email infrastructure. Any questions over, over that? Okay. Uh, TCP IP transmission process. Lots of points of failure. Um, the bigger the network, the more opportunities there is for failure. The, the larger the distance, the more opportunities there are for failure. Uh, in fact, the original idea behind the internet was that switches failed so commonly, there needed to be some redundancy in it. Uh, and so the, to, to get that redundancy, you have to have better quality switches, you have to have more switches. So as the network size increases and distance increases, you're going to have failures. But there's a lot of utilities that exist to be able to help you try to find the locations of those, of those, those errors, uh, to try to help you uh, figure out what those errors are and then take the next step in correcting those errors. Uh, nearly all TCP IP utilities are accept accessible from the command prompt. The syntax may differ, though, from one operating system to the next. There's a lot of similarities between some of the commands in Unix and Linux, uh, as well as Windows, but there's usually some little nuances that make them a little bit different. And so just because you're familiar with them in one doesn't necessarily mean you, you are in the other. But usually, if you're really good at one, it doesn't take too much effort to be really good at the other. Uh, IP config in the Windows world is IF config in, in Unix and the Linux world, pretty much. Uh, command line utility uh, providing network adapter information. It's going to give you information about the host that you're attached to. So whatever computer you're, you're typing into the keyboard at a command prompt, you type in IP config, it'll give you information back, like the IP address that's associated with that mas machine, the, uh, the, the subnet mask, etc. There's several switches that you can use. And in the Windows world, for switch, they'll use a, a forward slash. And the switch will allow you to ask for additional information. For example, in an IP config, you can ask for IP config all. That will give you a lot more information. It will give you information like the, the hardware address, the MAC address. Um, if you've got multiple network cards, it will give you a lot of that type of information as well. Uh, you do need an administrator device to be able to run it uh, to change the, the workstation IP configuration. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. If you type in IP config, here's an example. Like the wireless uh, LAN adapter is not connected. It's got an Ethernet adapter that is connected, and here's the uh, IP the version six address, IP version four address, subnet mask, and its default gateway, which is probably a router. So you can get certain pieces of information back about that. You can also see from looking at tunnel adapters that are running some kind of a, a, a VPN on it. 
So whereas IP config is in the Windows world, IF config is in the Linux and, and Unix worlds. Um, you can do a lot of the same types of stuff. You can modify the TCP IP configuration information directly from the command line. Uh, you can check the TCP IP status, etc. Um, let's see. Like the switches that you have in Windows, you also have switches in Linux and Unix, but they're a little bit different. So using the slash, they're going to use a dash uh, for some switches. No proceedings of characters for other switches. So an IF config dash E, you see your network adapters labeled a little bit differently, e ETH0, and it gives you, starts to give you information. Again, the hardware address, internet address, broadcast uh, address, etc., subnet mask. Et Any questions on that one? Because that's one that probably gets used an awful lot. IP config, ping. Uh, Netstat. Displays TCP IP statistics, component details, and host connections. You can use it without switches to display active TCP IP connections on the machine, or you can use it with switches. And so you'll see it'll give you a lot of information as well. You can get local addresses, um, foreign addresses, and what the state of that particular link is. NBT stat is not something we're really going to see all that much anymore. Um, it gets used if you're running that BIOS, and for the most part, we don't see a lot of machines running that BIOS, and a lot of networks running that BIOS anymore. Uh, it's an older networking, non-writable uh, um, uh, protocol, and as a result, that's why you don't tend to see it uh, used that much. It is compatible with TCP IP, but it just adds a little bit of complexity to the network. So still, you don't tend to see it all that much. Uh, let's see, the host name utility provides the client's host name, uh, which you can also use to change administratively from the command prompt if you need to. Uh, kind of gives you the ability to see where you are and what machine are you, can you logged into. Uh, the host utility, learn IP addresses from the host name. No switches returns the host IP address or host name. And then NS Lookup allows you to query a DNS database from any network computer to find the device host name by specifying its IP address. Uh, you can verify host configured correctly, troubleshoot DNS resolution problems, etc. Um, who is is kind of like that. I'm going to come back to these here in just a second, but who is is kind of like that. It's an online directory. Uh, uh, well, I say it's an online directory. Uh, in the Windows world, that's what you would do. You would go to some place like Network Solutions. They have a who is um, uh, uh, interface that you can type in the IP address of, a, uh, of, of someone, or you can type in the domain name of someone, and it will give you back information about that particular company, uh, contact information, etc. Um, so it's a good way to, to identify a particular domain, who's running it, things like that. DIG is Domain Information Groper. Uh, similar to NS Lookup, query DNS database, find a specific IP address hostname, useful for diagnosing DNS problems. The DIG utility provides more detailed information than NF, NS Lookup. Um, it's got a lot of different switches, so usually when you're working on a network, you're going to pick out a few utilities that you're used to that you like, and, and those are the ones you can probably focus on. This probably isn't going to be the one that you jump on, but uh, if you're using Linux or Unix, you may. You may. Already talked about this. Traceroute's a nice one in that it allows you to not only hit a specific host, but also look at all the various hops that exist in between. So when you send out a packet across the internet, <coughs> that packet goes through a series of hops. It goes first to your router, and then your router, unless the destination is on the other, right on the other side of your router, it goes from your router to another router, to another router, to another router, across the internet until ultimately gets to its destination. Well, when you ping a destination, the only information you're getting back is that it either hit its destination or it didn't. Traceroute's going to give you more information than that. Traceroute's going to tell you it hit this router first, then it hit that router, then it hit that router. It's going to give you the information about all the routers. It's going to give you additional information about how long did it take for that packet to get from one router to the next. So you can start to identify where in that whole mesh of hops did it start to slow down, or did something get dropped, things like that. 
So you can see uh, running a trace route here, uh, they ran a trace route on network solutions um, and it hits IP at this, uh, this particular router at this IP address and it took 21.171 milliseconds for that, that transfer to occur. And it does this next one, took an additional 13 milliseconds, an additional 13 milliseconds, et cetera, et cetera. MTR, Unix and Linux operating systems, similar to Traceroute, uh, route discovery and, and analysis utility, combines ping and Traceroute functions, and it provides it an uh, easy to read chart. And I think there's an example, yeah, right there. It's a little bit uh, uh, cleaner to look at than, than you might see with Traceroute, but it gives you a lot of information. It gives you, as far as sending uh, uh, packets, the last one, the average, the best, the worst, and standard deviation. So you can really start to analyze how long it's taking for your packets to go from point A to point B to point C, et cetera. So you can start to look at, at these, these routers right in here and say there's a lot of variation in those in the performance. Those might be really busy routers. And if you look at sbcglobal.net, Ameritech, yeah, those, maybe those are really busy ones. Route utility allows viewing a host routing table. Um, if you look at the routing table of a local, uh, a local machine, you're probably going to see a few entries because you keep your, your uh, local machine will keep track of that. If you look at a routing table of a router that's at an ISP, you may see thousands or tens of thousands of, of, of entries. Um, Windows-based uh, systems, you can type route that uh, space print and press enter to view it, or a Cisco brand router and you show IP, or just type in route in Linux. And that's what you might get back on a, on a, a, a desktop machine if you went to the command prompt and typed in route. Uh, so your destination uh, uh, gives you various information for different routes that you have on your local machine. You can edit these. Your routing table automatically populates itself. You can edit these, but be careful when you do that because if you accidentally cut off uh, a, a particular route that you need, you type in the route inappropriately, and you might be cut off. So run into problems manipulating your routing table. And then some of the switches associated with route. And I already mentioned that you can add, delete, modify routes. Same thing in Unix. You can type in man space route. That's the name of the command route. That will give you the manual for that particular command. It will give you all the information about the various switches, what the function does, things like that. And then the Windows type route, space, question mark. It will do the same thing and give you help information back about that particular command. So this chapter, like I said, talks about subnetting, but it was really, it was probably half the focus of the chapter. It really probably had been covered earlier in the semester. The rest of it was kind of stuff from various parts of the, the semester. So Designing TCP IP based networks, subnetting, CIDR, if we want to supernet, um, internet gateways, network address translation is, is something that virtually all small networks use anymore. Routers just automatically do that uh, with, with private IP addresses. Uh, TCP uh, mail services, we talked about the process of sending mail uh, across the internet, the process of, of downloading those, the different protocols that are used. And then the chapter finished up talking about utility commands in the Windows world as well as Linux and, and Unix and the similarities yet the distinctions between the two. Um, so it's what I, it, I refer back to what I said earlier. If you get really good at one, you're probably going to have a leg up in the other one, but you realize that there are some sub differences. So um, the exact same commands don't always work, but there are similarities. So that is that chapter. Any questions?